Hey, good morning. Morning. Um, so, Danielle, did you ever hear that? Life's not fair when you were growing up? Never. Uh, that's my 26-year-old daughter, right? Um, so I, I just have to, um, good morning, Rob. Glad to be with you. Habakkuk, yep. I was thinking, is Habakkuk ever one of those names that gets considered in, like, naming our children to the generations? Probably not, right? We've had Micah, Jonah, you know, I'm not sure Hosea would have qualified, but, you know, we've had a few of these minor prophets actually kind of show up in family names. Habakkuk, not so much. And I venture to say that most of us have probably never read Habakkuk, three chapters long. Great news, we're going to read the whole thing today. Yeah, I know you're psyched about it. I'm actually, though, this morning just uh, probably going to kind of change it up a little bit from uh, what my plan was. And I say that because I was on the road this week for work all week, um, came back, and it was a good week. I mean, it's always good to see people in person and, you know, those kinds of things. Um, but this morning in particular was just really like resting in the Lord, trying to say, okay, what's... Because I, I show up here, and I get excited, kind of excitable. Maybe you guys have picked up on that energy level sometimes. Because I just feel like, okay, it's just a, it's a time to kind of stop and hang out and just to be with God's people and be in His presence. I know He's with me all the time, but yet it's a bit more pronounced here. And so we, you know, uh, this morning we're reflecting on Psalm 4610. I'm sure we've heard this one, right? Be still and know that I am God. Just be still. Be still, waiting for the Lord. Talking about Sabbath, which Aaron and I, we didn't share this Sabbath, right? I, I had a conversation recently with someone that, you know, how come we don't talk about in the Ten Commandments to honor the Sabbath? We talk about having no other God or honoring your parents or don't kill, steal, those kinds of things. Do we ever talk about honoring the Sabbath? I mean, it was so important that the Lord gave that to Israel as part of his desire and plan for their good life, to honor the Sabbath, rest, be still. That I've used in the last few months from Matthew chapter 11, where Jesus says, oh, you busy, you worn out? Come to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. See, God has a desire for you to be still with him. He, he has a desire for me to be still with him, to sit and wait and be present and see what shows up. When we were doing the hands down, hands up, what ran, what ran through your head? No one shared out loud. I understand. It's a big place. Online, someone might have heard it, right? What if we're in someone's home and we're doing this? Maybe it might be a little more comfortable to talk about some of those things, which is understandable. But I've got the mic, so I'm going to share. <laughs> some of the things that ran through my head is um, relationships. One of my siblings, a sister and brother-in-law are separated. That's a recent development. They've got kids together and, you know, seeing firsthand the impact of those relationships and dealing with those challenges um, was really fresh on my mind and what could I have done? We've been married for a long, you know, quite a few years. What did I miss? They're in Washington State, so we're not near each other. That's a tough thing to have relationships that way from a distance. That was on my mind. My, uh, my wife's out of town this weekend with some girlfriends, which is great, but Carrie and I have had, it's not been the best couple weeks of communication for whatever reason. I'm going to say, at least from my perspective, it might be easier. She's not here to blame it on her, but I'm not going to. But from my perspective, I think some of my busyness, right? I really, my work, personally, with the Lord on spiritual disciplines, I've been just trying to, understand where silence and solitude and fasting, being with the Lord fits into my life. You know, I've talked about the app, you know, pray as you go in the morning. Praise God, it's been amazing for me. But that's like, you know, 20 minutes. What about some extended period of time of Sabbath and rest with the Lord? 
What about some extended places, maybe in creation, where there's nothing, no noises, no cell coverage? Ooh, that'd be awesome, right? No internet, no news. Just to, to be present. Let, this, let the Spirit minister to me. I haven't done that well, and I suspect it probably it has an impact on my relationships. Those are the things that were on my heart today. Sabbath is a gift from God. You might think you need to be busy. I'm guilty about that. I've got things to do. I had a bunch of stuff after being out of week. This next week is going to be busy at work. But you know, I'm pretty sure once I get there, they'll probably be okay. If I take a little extra time in the mornings or evenings, they're probably going to be okay. The Lord will be with me. It'll work itself out. Maybe not the way I expect it to. It's going to be okay. So what do we have to worry about? What do we have to look forward to? And how, as followers of Jesus, how do we think about the future informing and being here in the present? See, I think there's a connection there with what we've been doing with these minor prophets in that, sure, a few thousand centuries before, <laughs> right? on that side of Jesus and the cross and the resurrection, but the exact same hope, the exact same challenges of just the human condition in a very different setting, to be fair, very different, that we really can't relate to, but it's the same message. And this is where it's important for us as God's people, I believe, to spend some time listening and looking at those encouragements the words they use, the postures they take, maybe really difficult to understand. It is. It's different language, it's different imagery, different situation where God is actively working among his people as the nation of Israel, among all the other nations. Like, like history, like, like what's happening to this group of people is demonstrating who God is. And then we get on this side of the cross where we are, and it's so incredibly individual. In amazing ways, the presence of God is with us individually, no matter where you are. You don't have to be at the temple or be in Jerusalem. You're, he's with you. I mean, you can't get away from him. It's so different. And yet we choose to do it as individuals, so often more informed by the world than by our God. I don't know. Does that resonate with anybody today? Be still and know that I am God. That's what the psalmist said. It was a prayer of worship, probably a hymn. They probably sung it, and then I bet they had some quiet time. <laughs> be still and know that I am God. Just be still and know that I am your God. Some jades even being still and not making any noise right now. That's amazing. How many quiet, still moments do you have through the course of your day? Someone say, not enough? Yeah, <laughs> amen. Not enough. <laughs> it's a practice. It's a practice. And it's a gift. And it's so easy just to be running down the road. Okay, Aaron said that maybe today we'd be out here a little early. I don't know. We'll see. We're still going to read through Habakkuk, though. But I, actually, I'm, I want to change it up a little bit. I want to start with what my New Testament reading was. Because 
I, I think maybe, because I know I've been walking each week, starting with the old and working toward the new, which has been great, because I think you see what the Old Testament plan is and how it is fulfilled, like beyond the wildest dreams of what the prophets intended even knew, but how it has had been fulfilled in Jesus and then how we get to live in that today. I want to start with it today with um, uh, some reading from Luke chapter 17, verse 20. So just listen to this engagement. The first, Jesus is being engaged by some Pharisees, and then he turns to his disciples. Verse 20, one day the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? Good question. Good question, right? I mean, this is to think about, again, we're going back to the Old Testament, people, the, the nation of Israel, they've been thinking about when will the kingdom of God show up? What, was, what were their expectations and how would it appear? We could debate that for a long time. But that was their question. When will the kingdom of God show up? Honest question, I believe, for them to Jesus. Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there, for the kingdom of God is already among you. Now, for Jesus to say that, we on this side of the cross can say, yep, he was literally talking to them. Right? Do you recall when Jesus shows up in his ministry? Right, you go back, well, let's use Matthew, right? He shows up and he says, the kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe the good news. And that's, that's it. Jesus is the incarnate, the presence, the kingdom of God. It is, it is what all of those Old Testament prophets and, and, and people of the nation of Israel any time forward I've been looking for, right? And then they had the presence of God with them and all the stories you've heard about, the temple, the, the Ark of the Covenant, etc. And then Jesus, the incarnate, the second person of the Trinity, the Logos, the Word became flesh and walked among them, is with them. The kingdom of God is there, present. You won't be able to say, it's here it is, or it's over there, for the kingdom of God is already among you. That was his response to the Pharisees. Verse 22, then he said to his disciples, the time is coming when you will long to see the day when the Son of Man returns, but you won't see it. The Son of Man is how Jesus referred to himself. You will long to see the day when the Son of Man returns, but you won't see it. People will tell you, look, there is the Son of Man, or here he is, but don't go out and follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other, so it will be on the day when the Son of Man comes. But first, the Son of Man must suffer terribly and be rejected by this generation. So Jesus is telling them, you'll be longing for this, this return, but first, I must suffer and be rejected. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days, the people enjoyed banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat and the flood came and destroyed them all. <laughs> Is that a word of hope? or <laughs> I mean, law and gospel sort of stuff here, right? Hope or condemnation? I hear it as a story of hope, to be fair. All right. The question starts with the Pharisees. When will the kingdom of God come? Jesus says, you won't be able to find it. You can't. Someone says over there, it's over there. The kingdom of God is already among you. Then he turns to his disciples and says, look, the time will come when you long for the Son of Man to return. But first, he must suffer and be rejected. He must die. And it would become like the days of Noah. When those faithful people, what they do? They worship Yahweh. In the midst of a world that had no idea who God was. And what did God do? He saved them. He saved Noah. Not because there was anything special about Noah. But because God knew him and he knew God. There was a relationship there. There was a relationship. 
There's, there's a longing as Jesus is talking to these disciples, setting them up for after he would be gone, that you will long for me to return. But you won't know when I'm going to come. You just have to wait on the Lord. You just have to be still and know that I am your God. You just get to honor the Sabbath and rest in the life that God has given you. It's an amazing message of hope from Jesus to his disciples that day, taken in the context of everything we know about who God is. But it doesn't make it easy. See, this is, I think, how we view it today. This is the message of the prophets about, oh, there's judgment here. Oh, there's judgment coming. Oh, the rough days are among us. It's tough. But the Lord has a plan of hope and salvation which he is going to bring to us. That's all Jesus is saying, but this is the kingdom of God saying it, right? You will be looking for the Son of Man to return. Do we not pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus? Has God's people not been praying that for 2,000 years? And who knows how much longer shall we be praying it? But until he comes again, we do what God's people do. We gather. We listen. We live lives together. We be still and know that he is God. I really believe that's what Jesus is encouraging his disciples that day. Don't try to figure out when and where and what. Just, just be my people. Just live in the life that has been modeled and present from the beginning. <laughs> a life of repentance. A life of turning forgiveness, restoration of relationship with God. Now, with all of that, I'm going to stop real quick. Any reflections right now? What's running through your head that you're too afraid to say? The Spirit of God is in you and among us. Don't be afraid to share. Yeah. You need to enjoy life more? Yeah, okay. Why do you say that? That's that beautiful. No, I, I need to live. The comment was, I need to live in Sabbath more, and not just on Sundays, but every day. Yeah, it's a posture. See, I think we hear these things as Sabbath. Oh, it's a, it's a rule. It's the third commandment, or oh yeah, it's a remind. No, it's it's a posture. It's a relationship. We are creatures who have been called by the Creator, who is in charge of all things. And he's in the midst of our days regular. One of the things I miss is, is I am um, the church I served in Wisconsin. We actually had kneelers, and it was a really good posture to take. And I haven't done that for a while. And it's not just for Sundays in worship. Right? So whether it's a physical, literal thing you do, or a, a pause, a posture, it's an invitation. Right? It's an invitation. That's where when Jesus talks about this yoke which is easy and a burden which is light, it's like, really? I mean, there's a list of things I'm supposed to do. <laughs> yeah. But if we get to that place where it is that relationship and we're spending time with Jesus more regularly it turns into a, a yoke which is easy and a burden which is light because we we can sit in that place and say yep it's all yours God and I'm going to show up in the places that you put me I'm going to be present I'm going to engage the people that you let me engage with and we'll see what happens 
And there's an amazing freedom in that position. To be less worried about what others think of you and more worried about, am I spending time with my Savior? And that's a really kind of nebulous thing that's different for each one of us. We all have different homes and communities and neighborhoods we live in. And, and then on top of that, we have different paces of life. Young kids, no kids, adult kids. I mean, all kinds of stuff that we go through that we make decisions about. But every, every situation is an opportunity to make a new decision. And, and God just invites us into making decisions and living life as his children. Okay, I promise we really are going to get into Habakkuk at some point. But maybe, let's read it. Let's do it. It's only three chapters, okay? So let's do this. What I would like you to do as we work through this, I appreciate the comments and reflection. I, I trust. Anybody else resonate with spending more time in Sabbath, not just on Sundays? Raise your hand. Amen. Thank you for sharing. The Spirit of God put that on your heart to put words in it so that others would hear it as well. It helps to say things, folks. It helps to say it out loud. Um, okay, Habakkuk chapter 1. So what's interesting about Habakkuk, he's probably 600, 605, 610. We really don't, B.C., we really don't know specifically, but yet he, rep, he represent, or reflects on the Babylonians. So there's a period of time here about how God talks about using the Babylonians to impact the nation of Israel, so we can kind of narrow in that way. But there's not those aspects of it. And you have this back and forth between Habakkuk and God in the first two chapters, and then chapter 3 is a song. It's a hymn. It's a praise. It's a wonderful thing. So it's a very short book here. I'm just going to read through chapter 1 completely. If you have a verse that kind of jumps out at you, try to remember that number or the content, and maybe we can reflect on that a little bit, because I've, I've myself, granted, had a little more time, but I've reflected on this, and there's a couple verses through this book that really resonate with me, and keep in mind of doing this through what we read earlier from Luke chapter 17, that is looking for the, sun, for the kingdom of God to appear, not really knowing where, but how do we wait? How do we wait? How do we rest? How do we be still? while we're waiting as God's people for the kingdom of God to come, for the Son of Man to return those dynamics. Okay, Habakkuk 1.1. 1, 1. This is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. I'm just going to stop real quick. Does it sound like the news today? I mean, does it sound like maybe your neighborhoods? Okay, you know, 3,000 years old, but I mean, verse 4. The law has become paralyzed and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. That's Habakkuk's comment. Verse 5. The Lord replied, Look around at the nations. Look and be amazed. For I am doing something in your day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. I am raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. Their horses are swifter than cheetahs and fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their charioteers charge from far away. Like eagles, they swoop down to devour their prey. On they come, all bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind, sweeping captives ahead of them like sand. They scoff at kings and princes and scorn all their fortresses. They simply pile ramps of earth against their walls and capture them. They sweep past like the wind and are gone, but they are deeply guilty, for their own strength is their God. Verse 12, Habakkuk responds, O Lord, my God, my Holy One, who are you, eternal? You are, you who are eternal. Surely you do not plan to wipe us out. O Lord, our rock, you have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins. 
but you, you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. You will wink at their treachery. Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they? Are we only to fish to be caught and killed? Are we only sea creatures that have no leader? Must we be strung on their hooks and caught in their nets while we rejoice and celebrate? Then they will worship their nets and burn incense in front of them. These nets are the gods who made us rich, they claim. Will you let them get away with us forever? Will they succeed forever in their heartless conquests? Oh, okay, that last part, probably not how we talk so much, right? Not at all. Anybody hear anything in that first chapter? I know it's tough. The first time you're probably hearing it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So you heard a lot like things are today, especially in Habakkuk's words, right? Like what's going on, the context, what we do, etc. And then from there you get into what's occurring with what God is doing with the Babylonians. Which I think, Aaron, what was the word you used this morning or praying before worship? That, that God does th- une- unexpected means or unexpected ways? Something like that, right? He does things that we don't want him to do. So in this case, you have a backup calling out to God. And what does God say? Watch how mighty I am. I'm going to use the Babylonians to punish you, Israel. <laughs> I'm sure Habakkuk's like, okay, why'd I open my mouth? <laughs> How'd I ask what I asked for this, right? And you have this language of, of what God is, these people, these fierce people that would have been known throughout the entire world at that time that God takes and uses for his own purposes of punishment. And yet Habakkuk still calls out, have mercy on us. We are a a rebellious people. Doesn't say we don't deserve it. <laughs> he says we're rebellious. Have mercy on us. Don't let them prosper by the things that they use. That is the Babylonians. Okay, you get the message here. Really uplifting message today, right? So far. Chapter 2. Habakkuk continues on. I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. Habakkuk sounds kind of confident that the Lord's going to respond to him, doesn't he? Verse 2, then the Lord said to me, write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end and will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. Wealth is treacherous and the arrogant are never at rest. They open their mouths as wide as the grave, and like death, they are never satisfied. In their greed, they have gathered up many nations and swallowed many peoples. But soon their captives will taunt them, and they will mock them, saying, What sorrow awaits you, thieves? Now you will get what you deserve. You become rich by extortion, but how much longer can this go on? Suddenly your debtors will take action. They will turn on you and take all you have while you stand trembling and helpless, because you plundered many nations. Now all the survivors will plunder you. You committed murder throughout the countryside and filled towns with violence. What sorrow awaits you who build big houses with money gained dishonestly? You believe your wealth will buy security, putting your family's nests beyond the reach of danger. But by the murders you committed, you have shamed your name and forfeited your lives. The very stones in the walls cry out against you, and the beams in the ceilings echo the complaint. What sorrows await you who build cities with money gained through murder and corruption? Has not the Lord of heaven's armies promised that the wealth of nations will turn to ashes? They work so hard, but all in vain. For as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled 
with an awareness of the glory of the Lord. What sorrow awaits you who make your neighbors drunk? You force your cup on them so you can gloat over them, over their shameful nakedness, but soon it'll be your turn to be disgraced. Come, drink, and be exposed. Drink from the cup of the Lord's judgment, and all your glory will be turned to shame. You cut down the forests of Lebanon, now you will be cut down. You destroyed the wild animals, so now their terror will be yours. You committed murder throughout the countryside and filled towns with violence. What good is an idol carved by a man or a cast image that deceives you? How foolish to trust in your own creation, a God that can't even talk. What sorrow awaits you who say to wood and idols, wake up and save us. To speechless stone images you say, rise up and teach us. Can an idol tell you what to do? They may be overlaid with gold and silver, but they are lifeless inside. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Okay, that was chapter two. That was a lot there. Anything stick out? Yeah, I think, so it seemed like Habakkuk felt justified. Yeah, I think this is a tough one. I mean, just to be clear. I mean, it's tough because we don't necessarily have the direct reference. The, we aren't there in that time and place, right? I, I actually, the ones I noted at the beginning of this, I mean, let's read the whole thing again. No, I'm kidding. We won't do that. <laughs> it's the first couple of verses, actually, right? This is what I heard. I, this is Habakkuk, verse 1 of chapter 2. I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. I mean, I'm not sure that we go in front of God with like something where we feel like he needs to answer our complaints. But I bet we feel like we could do that. Meaning, I mean, do we not feel like our complaints are valid and justified that God doesn't give us what we deserve? Or... Others who are seemingly benefiting without being faithful, that they should be impacted. Maybe it's not about us getting what we deserve. They should get what they deserve, which is to not be doing so well. Well, maybe that one hits a little closer to home. The Lord knows. You can tell him. Have a conversation with him about it. And then verse 2, I also noticed these next kind of verses here, because this does sound like Luke to me. Then the Lord said to me, verse 2, Write my answers plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the message, correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end, and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will, be, it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Now, is that in future time in, with Israel and the Babylonians? Is it for us now? Yes, right? The prophet is speaking and it's going to be heard by generations and understood in different ways. Verse 4, so this is, what, this is the beginning of what God's response is. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their crooked lives, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. Wealth is treacherous and the arrogant are never at rest. They open their mouths as wide as the grave, and like death, they are never satisfied. In their greed, they have gathered up many nations and swallowed many peoples. The beginning of this one. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves, and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. This, to me, harkens back, as we read in Luke 17, about the time of Noah. The proud, they were doing what they wanted. What they saw was good in their own eyes. Noah and his family were the ones that were still righteous before God in a relationship, in a conversation with him, living that life of faith with the Lord. I think here the Lord's comment is, is to those who take comfort in their own wealth or activities and 
the Babylonians, whoever it may be, the Israelites who are suffering, who, if they remain faithful to God, will get what God has promised eventually. But I expect that for Habakkuk and the people of his day, that was a great word of comfort from the God who they had to devote their lives to. And then he went on from there with specifics within his response, right? which are just hard for us to understand. We have to connect with it sometimes, but it's just difficult within the context of Habakkuk some 3,000, you know, almost 3,000 years ago. Okay, chapter 3. This is the end. <laughs> and this is um, verse 1. This prayer was sung by the prophet Habakkuk. I could see where this would show up, as many do, probably in the life of worship for Israel. I don't think I've ever sung this. But you can see where this could show up in the life of faith of God's people. Verse 2, we'll read through this. Again, just listen to the words. This first verse is a beautiful one. I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, remember your mercy. It's good stuff. Verse 3. I see God moving across the deserts from Edom, the Holy One coming from Mount Paran. His brilliant splendors fill the heavens, and the earth is filled with his praise. His coming is as brilliant as the sunrise. Rays of light flash from his hands, where his awesome power is hidden. Pestilence marches before him. Plague follows close behind When he stops, the earth shakes. When he looks, the nations tremble. He shatters the everlasting mountains and levels the eternal hills. He is the eternal one. I see the people of Cushan in distress and the nation of Midian trembling in terror. Was it an anger, Lord, that you struck the rivers and parted the sea? Were you displeased with them? No, you were sending your chariots of salvation. You brandished your bow and your quiver of arrows You split open the earth with flowing rivers. The mountains watched and trembled. Onward swept the raging waters. The mighty deep cried out, lifting its hands in submission. The sun and moon stood still in the sky. As your brilliant arrows flew, your glittering spear flashed. You marched across the land in anger and trampled the nations in your fury. You went out to rescue your chosen people, to save your anointed ones. You crushed the heads of the wicked and stripped their bones from head to toe. With his own weapons, you destroyed the chief of those who rushed out like a whirlwind, thinking Israel would be an easy prey. You trampled the sea with your horses, and the mighty waters piled high. I trembled inside when I heard this. My lips quivered with fear, my legs legs gave way beneath me, and I shook in terror. I will wait quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people who invade us. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer able to tread upon the heights. That's a pretty good hymn of praise. (laughs) I'm not sure we'd sing it that way today, but in the context of Habakkuk and what's going on with the Babylonians and captivity and Israel being at the hands of of people who are coming to destroy them, even if God sent them, hear that message of hope. That message of I rest fully in the God of creation and not just I but the mountains and the seas I mean this this conveyance of how incredible God is and what he will do and what he will come and how his his powers will be shown because for Israel they saw it everywhere they looked they saw it everywhere in the nations around them it was happening in creation they saw that as part of the opportunity of God revealing his salvation for his people that's how big their God is It's the same God that shows up in Jesus, that comes humbly in a manger, willing to humble himself 
and come and walk among us. The same God that tells the Pharisees that day in Luke, the kingdom of God is among you. The same God that counsels for his disciples that there'll come a day and it'll be a rough day and you'll be looking forward to when the Son of Man returns. And those are the days we're living in, folks. I don't know that we would describe it as Habakkuk did or does, but I think we can connect with the message. I think the connection starts with everything we talked about earlier. Be still and know that I am God. Take joy in the gift of Sabbath, of rest, of presence. The God of creation promises that his spirit lives in you. He's with you. You can't get away from it. <laughs> that might be a little daunting, a little challenging, a little like, yeah, I don't know. I trust if you spend some time with him, he'll probably give you some comfort with that idea. He'll probably give you some experiences of presence, uh, maybe a still small voice, maybe some people that will come around you, an opportunity to share in some of the struggles you have, to be God's people together, whatever it is. But the invitation is there. The invitation is there. Amen?